that as your hashtag. You will see some other ones on your desk, on your table, little fat toys like trash the gas, dust the frogs, rocks the blocks. And so that's all the things we're talking about with in situ resource utilization. I know in some of your briefings earlier today, you probably already heard that term, ISRU, and maybe regolith, which is a fancy word for dirt. <laughs> so you probably have also heard about NASA's journey to Mars and how that's what we're kind of all going towards. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. Sorry. Um, so how many of you are from Florida? All right, so we just had our first hurricane of the season. So you guys all maybe have your hurricane bags packed and ready to go. <laughs> maybe, kind of pushing it. So you ever done that exercise where you had to pack a backpack and take everything you needed for let's say two to three days, all the water you needed, all the food you needed, you know, maybe some photos of loved ones, right? Well, imagine that you now have a rocket to put that in. So that's considerably bigger, right? So you can think, oh, I've got everything I need in there. But think instead of three days, you need enough to last you for a year and a half to two years, right? Because to get to Mars, that's six to nine months, you gotta be there, and then you're coming back. So a rocket isn't nearly quite as big as we first thought it was. We can't possibly take everything we need with us. So what do we do? That's where the ISRU comes in, where we're gonna use on-site resources. So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. We're gonna watch a short video from our um, center director, former astronaut Bob Cabana, and then I'll hand it off to Stan Starr, who is KSC's ISRU technical maturation manager. Fancy name. Uh, he makes sure that we're we're on the path, you know, to get us to Mars. People are building the rockets. These guys are solving all those other challenges to get us there. So with that, we'll start the video. We are pioneering. We have established a presence. The pioneers established a presence on the plains and settled the United States. We've established a presence, and we know how to live in low Earth orbit. But we want to go beyond that, and we want to explore and pioneer, establish a presence in our solar system. Where we have set up what we call our journey to Mars. And there's three zones. There's the Earth dependent zone. We're there right now with the International Space Station. And to get to Mars, that Earth independent zone, we need to get out to this proving ground in the middle and prove the systems that we need to establish that trip to Mars to make it viable with the propulsion technology that we have today where a, a mission to Mars is anywhere from a year and a half to two years to get there, have time on Mars, and come home. And there's a lot that we need to learn to make that happen. In the Earth Reliance Zone, the International Space Station is a fantastic engineering testbed to prove those systems that we need to become truly Earth independent. To get to the International Space Station, we need a reliable way to get there. We've been going back and forth to low Earth orbit for 50 years. We know how to do that. We need to focus on that, that exploration part of it. So we have the commercial crew program. Commercial cargo right now with orbital ATK and SpaceX with the Dragon and commercial crew with Boeing with the CST-100 on an Atlas V and uh, SpaceX on the Falcon with the uh, Crew Dragon. We also have operations we need to conduct to prove that we can operate away from planet Earth for an extended period of time, both operations and with the systems that we need before we can go to Mars, and that's gonna be uh, critical. How are we gonna get there? We're gonna get there with the Space Launch System and Orion. And the first thing that we have to do if we're gonna be able to get to Mars is have a rocket that can get us there, that's SLS. It truly is a unique vehicle and the most cost effective for what we have. It is evolvable. Uh, this is a program, you know, that is capability-based. We're going to have to have a crew vehicle. That's the MPCV, Multi-Purpose Crew Vehicle Orion. And I look back, you know, it was December 17, 1903, when Orville and Wilbur made that flight at uh, Kitty Hawk. And uh, the first powered flight traveled a distance of about 120 feet. That's the length of the space shuttle and lasted about 20 seconds. Look where we are today. And I believe the next 50 years of space flight are gonna be even more phenomenal than those first 50 years that NASA had. Good afternoon. Uh, what I'm gonna do is give you about a 15 minute overview of what we're talking about today, and then I'm gonna turn you over to our panel of experts. So my name is Stan Starr, and uh, what I want to talk about today is how we're going to pioneer space. You know, perfect segue to what Bob Cabana was just discussing. 
Uh, and our emphasis is on what we do when we actually get there. Uh, just to start out with a quote from President Obama when he gave a speech to NASA and, and to the country in, in 2010, he basically directed NASA to look beyond Earth orbit and to look at pushing out into the solar system. And that's one of the quotes from his speech and I want to emphasize in ways that are more sustainable and even indefinite. So the question is, how do we live in space indefinitely? How do we get to a point where we say we're from Mars, that we live on Mars or some other celestial body? And how do we piggy, you know, how do we stepping stone, step stone out to the solar system? That's the subject of, of today's presentation. Um, so in response, NASA created this framework called the Journey to Mars. And what it amounts to is a plan and an architecture of how we can eventually get to Mars and live on Mars. And as Bob Cabana said, there's three phases which he mentioned. On the left is Earth Reliant, and that's where we are today. All of our activities involve going to low Earth orbit, we're doing research on the ISS that is helping lay the groundwork. Uh, some of Joya's systems are operating on the ISS growing plants. But of course, for the, some of the ISRU folks, there isn't any regolith on the ISS. And the ISS is zero G. It doesn't have like one third G. So it doesn't do everything we need. Now the proving ground is the space basically in between Earth and Mars, where we'll prove out new vehicles, new systems, and you'll see, you see Orion, Orion is designed to go to the moon, uh, these various systems that will eventually take us to Mars. On the far right is Earth independent. That's where we need to be, that's our goal. And we want to be able to reliably live on Mars. And how do we do that? And that's the discussion today. So as a historical analogy, the European settlers to this continent didn't bring over all the food and all the building materials and everything they needed to construct a life in the new continent. They brought over tools in very small ships. And likewise, we're not going to go to Mars in Battlestar Galacticas with everything we need to live forever. We're going to go in small spaceships with tools. And these are the tool builders. And so, you know, and, and why do we need to do that? And I'll talk about that. But the main motivation is it's very expensive in mass to put something on Mars. For every kilogram on Mars surface, we have to have 225 kilograms out on the launch pad. So there's a very brutal calculus of mass, of pro mainly propellant, getting the delta Vs we need to get to Mars. And on the other side of the coin, Mars has abundant resources. So why take all the mass you need? Why not create it on Mars? So that's, and we call this pioneering, by the way. So the, the term or the system capability that we have within NASA is called ISRU. It's not called ISRU. Uh, it's in situ resource utilization. In other words, utilize the resources you find in place. Take the tools with you. You have to know in advance what's there because those tools have to be designed and built and validated, verified, and use those tools for the commodities. And I'll mention many examples of those. The solar system contains abundant resources. You know, we generally look at the solar system in scientific wonder, which it is. But once you start looking at it from ISRU, you see that there's lots out there that we can use to live on, and including sunlight, by the way. Um, and ISRU will mine these resources and convert them to things that we can use. And I'll give several examples of that. And we're also looking to convert waste. Astronauts, of course, produce waste, we all do. Well, that waste is a valuable resource. For every pound of astronaut waste, waste we get 0.7 pounds of propellant. So essentially, we're, this is an economy where nothing can be wasted. We have to utilize everything we find and everything we have and reutilize it. So what are our potential sites for ISRU? Well, basically anywhere where there's mass. Uh, almost anything in the solar system has something we can use, something we can convert to a useful commodity. Uh, the moon, the equatorial moon, the regolith contains lots of oxygen. The poles of the moon contain tremendous amounts of water. And Jackie is here for the, the resource prospector mission, which will hopefully be going to the moon in a few years. And to look at those 
trillions of kilograms of water that are in place in the soil that we can potentially use uh, on the moon and to, to help us get to Mars. Uh, Mars and its moons. Of course, we know now that Mars has tremendous amounts of water uh, in various forms, and I'll mention a couple. Asteroids. Asteroids are each a unique resource available to us. Uh, and of course, all other solar system bodies. Basically, if it has mass, it has something that we could use. Uh, and just focusing on Mars for a moment, uh, we're looking at using the CO2. Mar Mars atmosphere is 95% CO2. We can capture that CO2 and use it for all kinds of things. Uh, there's permafrost in the higher latitudes of Mars. Uh, but mainly what we're looking at right now is hydrating minerals in the soil. We can take soils over what we believe to be very wide areas of Mars, heat them up to a few hundred degrees Celsius and drive off a considerable amount of water out of those. It's kind of counterintuitive. It's like going to the Sahara Desert and baking sand to get your water, but it, it actually will work. Uh, and the other, the real resource that we'd like is buried glaciers. There's huge glaciers of ice that are buried uh, in the soil in the mid-latitudes, but we don't know how deep they are yet. So there's a lot of information that we need from a prospecting standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the things that we can do with these resources? Uh, we can get oxygen from regolith. Uh, most of the minerals that we look at on Mars and on the Moon are metals combined with oxygen. So at sufficiently high temperatures and with catalysts and other techniques, we can strip out that oxygen and have metals that we can then use for manufacturing. Uh, water from soil volatiles uh, on the moon. Uh, you know, Jackie's going to send a probe to the moon to actually extract icy soil and pull off those volatiles and some of the hardware is over there uh, and actually look at what those volatiles are and how we can use them. CO2 from Mars atmosphere, as I mentioned, construction materials. You certainly wouldn't want to take bricks to Mars, would you? So, you know, we can use the in situ materials, consolidate them, and use them. Also for landing pads, we're very concerned about rocket blasts when you have to land at the same place over and over again. Uh, berms, trenches, regolith for greenhouse soils, growing plants, uh, metals from regolith, plastics. If you've got carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, not only can you make propellants and and life support commodities, you can also make plastics. So between metals and plastics, you can make a lot of the things you're going to need or things you make break. And of course, food and oxygen for, from plants. Plants are a very important component, not only for crew mental health, but for uh, purifying oxygen, purifying water, and, and uh, providing food. So to go through the graphics, so this is sort of our Mars scenario. Um, and to go through this, and I think, oh, the graphic's right here behind me. So starting out at the bottom is prospecting. We need to know what's there, what its state is. For example, if something is in the soil, how much of it? What's the physical properties of the soil? How hard is it to dig up? If we dig it up, are we going to lose the volatiles that are in there? So the first thing we need to do is prospecting. Next, we need to mine that resource. So we go out and we excavate the soil, in this case, the upper layer of hydrated soils on Mars and we take them to a processor, which is up at the top center. That processor, we dump the wet soil in, it dries that soil, it purifies it, it creates hydrogen and oxygen. Combined with the CO2, we get methane, and now we can produce propellants, life support commodities, uh, including oxygen and inert gases, and of course water uh, that we need. Cryogenic storage, we're gonna need to store those. Our current plan is to send a bunch of hardware to Mars, a Mars year in advance, it produces all the commodities the crew needs to make it home, and they're waiting for them. When the crew lands, those commodities are ready. So should something arise, they can leave immediately if they have to and come back to Earth. But those commodities will be in cryogenic storage on the surface of Mars. And in the upper right, we have the plant facility where we'll be growing plants. Uh, as I mentioned, and on the left is the Mars Ascent vehicle. That's what we're going to load with propellants. Remember, 225 kilograms on the launch pad for every kilogram we land on Mars. With one metric ton of hardware on Mars, we can produce 27 metric tons of methane and oxygen propellants. That's two SLS launches that we save by putting a small amount of robotic systems onto Mars. Of course, we have to make them. 
very difficult. But, uh, and, and of course, in the center is the human habitat, and that's the center focus, is to make sure that that crew is not, not only able to perform their mission, but survive and perhaps return to the Earth. So that's, uh, I believe that's all I have, and I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. So, as our journey to Mars, the four main things that we need to solve are, how do we get there, right, that's the SLS. Once, once we get there, how do we land? How do we live and work there? Thank you, Dan. Which is pretty much what we're going to talk about today. And then finally, how do we get back home? So, I'm going to introduce our panelists. So, what I want to encourage you all to do, you have... an unprecedented number of heavy hitters in the room with you right now. So please take advantage of this opportunity. During the event, I know you guys just sat through two possibly boring briefings. I don't want this to be a third one, okay? I want you to interact. If you, they were good, okay, good, I'm glad you're excited. I love that decision, you're always so excited, it's awesome. Um, so we want this to be interactive. So I have questions to ask, but at any point if you have a question, just say, hey, Amanda, I've got a question, stand up, Speak as loudly as you can and ask it, and then we'll uh, assign it to the, the appropriate panelists, and we'll just keep going like that throughout the day. At the end, so we're gonna do this until about four o'clock, so we've got about 45 minutes, and then at four, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes, you'll see some show and tell kind of cool stuff out here, um, so that way you can go and speak to the experts one-on-one -on -one and take a look at the hardware, the engines that they brought, maybe the plants that they brought with them, okay? So please feel free to tweet whatever you need to do, share with your followers what you've learned here today, while you're here, after you've left here. So you're helping us get this message out. These are things that a lot of the public don't know about. They hear about SLS, they see the rocket. They don't know about all these other kind of, they seem less significant, but they're huge. We can't get to Mars until these challenges are solved, okay? So, no pressure, guys. <laughs> So we'll start with uh, Dr. Daniel Britt. He's a professor, professor of astronomy at the University of Central Florida and director of the NASA Funding Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Science. His research interests include the physical and surface properties of asteroids, see our tie-in, uh, the moon and Mars. We have Dr. Jacqueline Quinn. She's an environmental en engineer with NASA and was recently inducted into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame for her work in environmental remediation. Currently, Dr. Quinn serves as the project manager for Resolve, the resource prospector science payload that will search for resources on the moon in the near future. She has some show and tell items, so make sure you see her afterwards. Dr. James Mantovani, down at the end. Okay, there we go. Uh, so he has a PhD in physics and is a lead scientist for the KSC Swampworks in the Granular Mechanics and Regolith, there's a fancy word for dirty end, Operations Lab. He is currently working on research and development in the area of ISRU for the Moon, Mars, and asteroids. Dr. Philip Metzger in the middle. He's a planetary physicist who recently retired from NASA and is now at the University of Central Florida, but he still works with us quite a bit. He's predicting how rocket exhaust interacts with extraterrestrial soil, investigating the mechanics of soil, and characterizing lunar and Martian soil stimulants, among other things. Dr. Joya Massa, right next to him. So who's seen the Martian, right? And what did he grow? Potatoes. Potatoes, what does she have? Potatoes <coughs> that have been grown in a Martian simulator. So Joya is our resident space farmer, so she has a team that she works with, so she's not alone, but she's our awesome face of veggie. Um, so she researches food production in space for future exploration endeavors. She led NASA's veggie team that grew plants on the ISS, the International Space Station, and is currently working with the team researching the right nutrient blend for growing plants in Martian soil. Kyle Dixon, he's a cryogenics technology development lead at KC and is researching the possibility of using methane from Mars in rocket engines. And we have an engine with you today, so check that out. Annie Meyer at the end. She's a chemical engineer at Kennedy who works on ISRU systems, reactor design, waste conversion systems and has spent four months in a Martian isolation simulation environment in Hawaii. So you guys heard like the one group that just finished a year. So yeah. she was one of the, were you one of the first groups that did four months? The first psychological study. Awesome, <laughs> we might have some good stories to tell. <laughs> and Rob Mueller, I skipped over here, sorry about that. Uh, he's a senior technologist and robotics expert in KC Swampworks. 
which is a, a hands-on environment for innovative and cost-effective exploration solutions. So here is your panel, and we're going to begin with Dr. Quinn, because we're going to tie it into Osiris Rex. So, um, sorry, Dr. Britt. <laughs> Right? So, as Osiris Rex is proving, we are searching for resources everywhere, you know, in our universe. So, what can we learn by studying the regolith from an asteroid? What you're going to learn is how these kinds of materials interact with the space environment, and also what you can use them for. Um, one of the things I've been doing is working with Dr. Metzger and uh, KSC Swampworks my colleagues all along this table to make simulant that is very much like the Bennu stuff that we're going to be recovering, except we can make this by the ton rather than bring it back by the gram. And then you can use it for engineering tests. And this stuff, from this stuff, we got this, water. And it's actually CO2 rich water. So it's actually an uh, excellent um, feedstock for making fuel. And that's the whole point, is that these tons of material are already up there. And if we explore smart, we can actually make huge use of those resources to get where we need to go. Excellent. On that note, so now Dr. Quinn, sorry about that. Um, I used to call me Jackie. <laughs> so that's an asteroid. So you're going to be heading, your uh, payload will be heading to the moon soon. So you want to tell us a little bit about um, that mission um, that your work has currently been formulated the Resolve payload, which will head to the moon's south pole in search of resources. Yep, so um, I always believe that a picture is tell a thousand words, so I'm going to, in just a second, and I'll let you know, I'm going to actually show you a video, and I don't want everybody to try to scramble to look at it. It is online. You can actually get to the video. Just uh, take a, a search in your search engine and look up Resource Prospector. Um, that's the mission. We're in our formulation uh, phase for Resource Prospector. That's uh, phase A in NASA lingo. And uh, our objective is to take us to the moon's poles. We're, you know, based on cycles of the uh, rotations and all the phenomenon that happens, we can go to either the north or the south pole because there were previous missions that happened, LCROSS and LRO, that have told us that what we thought was a formerly dry moon is actually quite a moist moon. Um, and Stan alluded to the, the significant quantity of water that is um, that found itself at the linear poles. So we actually have, can uh, do a landing at the North Pole or the South Pole, depending on what season it is, um, either the um, winter or the fall term, the number November time frame, or, or in the spring time frame. And I think the best thing to do is just to show you a video, and, and so I can see it, I'm going to, um, that's actually not the video we want. These are some tests that they're doing um, in JSC. Our rover is actually being built at Johnson Space Center and in concert with Ames, and they're doing some wheel testing here. There's a, another on that website. Um, sorry, that's not, the, that's not the, oh well, that's not the video I thought you were going to play. That's your challenge, your homework, go Google that. <laughs> Um, but anyway, these are some slip tests we were using on the rover um, to look at how deep and how st steep of an angle we're actually able to um, crawl along. There are three major factors when you go to either the North or the South Pole. We are a solar mission, um, and our main mission is to prospect for water, um, water ice, right? So when you're a solar mission, you got to rely on three things. You have to have um, the terrain that you can traverse, and that's what you're seeing these videos on. Um, how, how steep can you go down if you need to to find it? So there's a terrain map. There's also a solar map. So when we land in the, in the polar regions, we're reliant on the sun to recharge our batteries. And so we're looking to um, see where the solar is and make sure that we don't go into a situation where we go battery negative and we can't um, move again. Um, so we want to make sure we have good um, solar capability or overlap of that with terrain. And then, of course, there's calm. Um, we, we have direct to Earth from the lunar area, and so we want to make sure that we don't have any calm dropouts, um, that we're able to download our data. So today, um, we brought replicas and actual some of our testing hardware, our engineering units that we have for you, so I encourage you to stop by the table. I want to point a couple people because I can't talk to 100 people at a time. Um, we have a couple folks in the back with us from the Resource Prospector payload team. Um, Jim Smith is my lead system <coughs> engineer. The technical responsibility for the payload as a whole um, in the light blue. And then we have two guys from our software team, Renee Formosa and Jim Kanya, also so between the four of us we can answer questions. 
So Resolve in general is a payload that's made up of five instruments, and I thought we were gonna have this video up here and I wasn't gonna have to talk through it, but I, I didn't check what video, I sent her a, a web link that had it all in there, but you guys can go find it, okay? It's a really cool video. It shows you direct insertion into the lunar and, and the beginning of our prospecting. So Stan mentioned we've got a prospect. We've got to find where the water is, and that's what RP is supposed to do, resource prospectors, go find it. It's using a series of five instruments to find um, water and, and analyze it and figure out how much mass is there. The instrument suites include a neutron spectrometer. So we've got a bunch of fancy words for neutron spectrometer. I always liken that to um, when you go to the beach and you're looking for the Spanish medallion, you don't just go with your shovel, right? You go with what? detector of some sort, right? It's usually a metal detector, and it goes beep, 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 when you hit something. Well, this is a neutron spectrometer, looks for epithermal neutrons, which is another fancy word, but it just means that it's looking for a hydrogen signal. It can't tell you if that hydrogen is bound as water, or it's solar implanted hydrogen, or it's attached to um, you know, some other methane, which is a CH4 molecule, has a bunch of, of uh, hydrogens around it. But it can tell you, I found, I found hydrogen. So it's traversing along, and all of a sudden, it, it sees something different, and it can say, I found a region of interest. I found something that has a higher hydrogen concentration than where I was just before. And so we get that, we use that to help us guide us, because we expect to go about three kilometers with our rover on this mission. So our tortuous path may be a total of three kilometers, but we may only go a point to point distance of one kilometer. If you measured it as a crow would not fly in the moon with no answer, but good analogy. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what we're looking for with a neutron spectrometer. We also have another spectrometer, and we have some models of it up here, which is a near infrared spectrometer. And that spectrometer will look for water grains. It was what was on L cross. Um, a different spectrometer. If near infrared and neutron determine that we get a good water signal, um, we'll probably stop and we'll use our third instrument, and that's a drill. And that's what we have in the corner over here. That's the actual drill that we've taken up and used um, in our 2015 uh, execution, and it's one we're doing um, tests in a lunar vacuum chamber up at Glenn Research Center. So that drill's over there for you uh, to take a look at. And the third, fourth instrument is an oven. That's where we put the vault, we drill up the sample, bring it to the surface, we put it into the oven, and the oven heats it up stepwise, and vaults will come off. That's the third, fourth instrument, and then we send it to a LABA, which is a Lunar Advanced Volatiles Analysis. That's the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And what y'all are gonna think is really cool about that instrument is it has a water droplet visual camera. So when we go to the moon and everybody goes, all us scientists get really excited about chromatograms because they're like squiggly lines, and we want to know what those squiggly lines mean. But to a second grader, it doesn't quite reach them. So we are gonna actually image water and show you what it looks like to make a water on the moon. And we, uh, that's part of that ISRE process where we actually make it. It's coming off, it's, it's frozen solid to a grain of lunar regolith, or means the term for dirt. Um, and, and we're gonna actually heat it up, volatilize it, send it to um, a, a gas chromatograph and actually get a very quantifiable number. And then we'll actually capture it again on a cold finger, causing a phase change, and then we'll be able to image it and send it back to you. So we're gonna prospect, we're gonna look for it, because as Mr. Cabana and Stan explained to you earlier, we're in this in this cislunar space where we're not quite Earth reliant and we wanna show that we can use these resources elsewhere. So that's a big picture and, and please go uh, do a search in your search engine for a lunar prospector and you can watch the whole video and the insertion and all that kind of stuff. Sorry about that, maybe we can get it at the end here. So as you guys can see, we're talking about resources on asteroids, resources on the moon, and so Jim, this next question is for you. So these are our proving grounds locations to get us to Mars. So how important is it that we focus on this ISRE research from the proving grounds now as a stepping stone to Mars? Uh, whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I work in the swamp works and uh, we're interested in, in using the, the regolith or the soil uh, to, to, uh, to as, as Stan and, and, uh, has said, to extract uh, oxygen and water from, from, from the regolith. Now, the, the, uh, the per, uh, NASA's goal in, with ISRU is to make consumables, and uh, for, it could be for life support, it could be propellant for rocket ships. Uh, to do this on a, on a remote uh, planet or an asteroid, uh, the systems have to be very reliable. Uh, they have to be robust. They have to be able to work in environments that are uh, very extreme. And there's not going to be uh, a lot of 
uh, leeway as far as uh, if, if, some, if something breaks down, how, how are you going to fix these ISRD systems? So they need to be very robust. Uh, that's the biggest challenge. Good. So we had the next one would be for you, Rob. So Jack had talked about for um, the moon, it's important where it lands. And I know, I don't know if you guys heard, there's this North Carolina teenager who just um, helped NASA decide where the Mars 2020 rover will land. How important is it? So once we have these reliable systems that Jim was talking about, and much like the prospect on the moon, how important is it where we land on Mars? What, what do we need to take into account for to get the most bang for our buck? Well, it's just like mining on Earth. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen these uh, TV shows where they look for uh, gold or other valuable resources. And uh, the, the first thing they do is they dig. But, but sometimes it's a, it's a dry hole, there's nothing there. So we have to prospect before we mine. And prospecting usually means drilling a hole so that you can see if there's anything valuable there. So the biggest challenge for landing on Mars is we don't want to land somewhere and assume that there's water in the regolith and then we land and there's no water there. So in order to do the prospecting, NASA is uh, doing an orbital mission, Mars 2022, with instruments on board to look for water in the soil, in the regolith on Mars, using remote sensing, that means from orbit. But at some point, we need what's called ground truth, because the resolution is not good enough from orbit. So we need ground truth, and when you go and get that ground truth, uh, you have to go to the right spot. If you haven't gone to the right spot, you've just wasted $2 billion. So it's very important to do your prospecting from orbit very, very well. And then when you land, you have to do a good job prospecting with the ground truth. And if that goes well, then you can send the human mission because you can't come home without the resources. We make the propellant for the Mars Ascent vehicle with local resources. You need 30 tons of propellant to come home. And so we make that from the resources on Mars, from the atmosphere and from the water and the soil. That's why it's so important to pick the right landing spot. And that's a beautiful segue to Kyle here. Let's talk about propellant. And you're working on a methane engine. So if you want to talk a little bit about how we can use the resources from Mars or the Martian atmosphere or even the, the regolith um, to make that happen. OK, well, um, the analogy that I thought of was you guys, pretty much everybody in here has a car, I'm sure. When you go to the gas station, what choices do you have? Do you have an 87 or an 84, 87, 89, or 91, depending on where you go to? Now, for the rocket engine, the guys, when, when they dig the dirt out of the ground, and they put it in their plant, and they produce um, liquid meth or gaseous methane, and they chill it, and they make liquid methane out of it, and they do the same thing with oxygen. The guy that's producing the plant is going to ask the guy that has the engine, well, what do you, how much do you need? What, what kind of purity do you need? The engine guy's going to say, well, I'm used to 99.9%. The plant guy's going to go, well, that's kind of steep. Can you live with 99.5? In other words, can you live with, I know you use 91 octane. Can you live with 87? So that's what this engine is, one of the, the projects this engine is going to work on. Based on what the plant designers think they're going to produce from a purity standpoint, we can use in this lock methane engine here, and you guys can talk to me afterwards about it. We're going to use that engine to test the perpetual propellants and its constituents. You know, you might have, um, say, the plant guy says, "Hey, I can live, I can live re reasonably with producing 90% um, methane," and then I'm going to ask him, "Well, what else is? What's the other 10%?" Because depending on what it is, it might freeze out. It might become a solid when it becomes cryogenic. It might uh, react with the uh, components of the engine. If it's a complex engine, it's going to go through a whole bunch of different temperature and pressure regimes that might make a normally benign um, uh, constituent in addition to the methane. You know, normally, in normal circumstances, it doesn't do anything. But you put it under the right pressure and the right temperature conditions, it can start attacking your metal. So that's where this project comes in. We're going to, we're going to take the soup that comes out of the, out of the plant, and then we're going to start doing a, an iterative process where he gives me a product and I say, well, can you, can you take this out? And he says, well, I can do that, but it's gonna cost X number of dollars additional to design the plan. So we are working on a way to derive the, the propellant from the atmosphere or from regolith. And so, um, Dr. Mesker, this one's for you. 
So what about having um, fuel depots on our way to Mars? Like, what's the likelihood of that? What's the scenario look like to get us to Mars? Okay, so as Stan mentioned early on, there's a big uh, gear ratio for getting to Mars. For every kilogram you want to put on Mars, you want to put 200 and something kilograms um, on the launch pad. And so if so that drives the cost of space missions. If we can get the propellant in space and then get it into a rocket, get it into a lander, then we can dramatically cut the cost of Mars missions. And we know that there's propellant that we can make in space. Dan just showed the water that we extracted out of that bone dry regolith. So we can get water out of, out of a rock in space. But we need to have some way to get it from the rock into the rocket. And so that's where propellant depots come in. One thing we could do is put a propellant depot in orbit around the Earth, and that would actually have a commercial application too. Companies can build space tugs, and when you launch a spacecraft, like a communication spacecraft into orbit, you don't need an upper stage anymore. And so you don't have to pay for the cost of launching an upper stage every time. Instead, the space tug can refuel and then boost the spacecraft the rest of the way and get it there quickly. And, um, that can cut the cost of the, the launch by hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so building off of that, we can then get propellant from the moon or from asteroids, and we can fuel up our spacecraft going to Mars. We could also put a, a propellant depot in Martian orbit, and, uh, or maybe on Phobos. And I know Mar uh, Rob is working on a very innovative method to make propellant in Mars orbit. He just got a, a very prestigious NIAC project to work on that. And then you can also make propellant on the surface of Mars. So if you have gas stations along the way, Earth orbit, Mars orbit, then this, um, this gives you an architecture of refueling and uh, it'll dramatically, maybe a, a factor of five perhaps, um, reduction in the cost of Mars missions. So speaking of cutting costs, so Annie, this is for you. So we know that um, it costs about $10,000 for every pound that we launch into space. So tell us a little about, about the work that you do with the waste products that astronauts experience. We have an image up there and how we can turn that into resources. All right, so waste takes up a lot of space on spacecraft as well as habitat. And if you're wondering what kind of waste astronauts are producing, we have clothing. There's no washing machine on Mars. So after a while, they, um, for crew morale, get rid of their clothing, their sneakers. Um, there's food waste. There's biological waste, there is a lot of pack packaging waste from experiments and science as well as the food. So here at KC, we're investigating and researching technologies that can convert this waste into useful products such as fuel. We can basically take all of these uh, trash products that have carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, which you can chemically manipulate through a thermal chemical process and make fuel such as methane, and you can recover um, water, and you can also make uh, hydrogen depending on what process you're looking at. So a couple of systems we've looked at are steam reforming, and right now we're testing a system called plasma arc gasification, which makes a syngas, which has methane and hydrogen, and then also anything inorganic, such as metals, it becomes a um, slag material, which is a construction aggregate, and then we also can recover water from the system. Um, so that's basically what we're doing here uh, because trash isn't gonna go away and it actually takes a lot of energy to just chuck trash out of a spacecraft because someone said that one day in a meeting and we had to look into it. Um, and obviously I wasn't a fan of it because we're all about reusing and repurposing commodities. And so it actually takes quite a lot of energy to open up an airlock when you're in transit or um, in another, uh, uh, if you're on the surface of Mars. And so it's important that we get something useful out of it because it, it costs $10,000 to get about one pound of payload out of Earth's orbit, so why not reuse it into fuel if it's already just waste that's been launched up into space? Excellent. So Joy, this one's for you. So speaking of things taking up space on spacecraft. So plants, so food. So astronauts are gonna need food. How are we gonna get that to Mars? And what are the implications? So the research you're doing now on the ISS, so what's the implications of that for on Mars? And then what are the benefits of growing plants on Mars? Right, I mean, food is something we all are kind of dependent on, um, and it's not gonna be easy to simulate from regolith or, or anything else, but seeds are very small. Seeds are, are easy to take. Now, right now we're taking 
pretty much all our food with us in the space station um, as packaged food that provides a lot of the packaging waste that Annie was talking about. Um, and, and that's big, big um, bulk of the material that you need to ship if you were going to take all your food with you to Mars. So the more that you could produce um, from small seeds, the better off you are in saving resources. And there are going to be break-evens and trades. You know, you need energy to grow plants. Um, but at the same time, the plants, as a, as a byproduct, as a as waste product, you might say, produce oxygen. So they can take up CO2 that might be available on Mars and make oxygen for the fruit of reef. Um, there are a number of different types of plants that we can grow. You can start with things that are just fresh that you can pick and eat, like we're doing on Space Station right now. There's no way to cook your food on Space Station. So we have to just look at things that you could eat as fresh salads. Um, but the farther you go, the longer you stay, you probably have some sort of cooking capability. And then things like potatoes do become a good option. You might not want to eat raw potatoes, but cooked potatoes are pretty good. Um, and <coughs> other crops could be added depending on the amount of, of, of available time and resources. This would be a, a great opportunity for robotics as well, because if you have astronauts who are really busy doing a lot of other things, they don't want to be subsistence farmers, right? So having robotics to take care of the plants could be a, a huge um, savings of crew time, which is a big challenge that we have right now. So I think um, the psychological benefit is something we're really just starting to study, but a lot of the, the astronauts that you know, we've spoken to after they've grown plants on the ISS, so they can't really imagine going to Mars or going to deep space exploration missions without having plants growing there, without having that little piece of earth to remind them of home. So that could actually be the most important aspect of all. So since you touched on the psychological, I'm gonna take it back to Annie really quick, and I apologize for the rest of you, I'm not favoring her. Um, but talk about your really quick, your um, isolation simulation. Um, and what the implications are for Mars. All right, so if you ever went on a trip and you thought, oh, I'm not sure if I want to drink the water there because maybe mm -hmm. it'll make me sick, so you try to plan out where you're going to buy your water from or maybe pack it, ISRU would totally bring comfort to a crew, knowing that there's already something on the surface of Mars producing commodities from local resources that you're able to survive on is a huge uh, comfort and just knowing that say something gets lost in transit or you something doesn't make it, it can really put you in a situation that you don't want to be in as an explorer on Mars. So I think not only do the explorers, whoever ends up on Mars, have to worry about being handy with the hardware um, and emotional issues that may happen amongst your crew because you have a, a large communication delay, it's a very long journey to Mars, um, having systems that work and are producing your, your survivable commodities uh, is a major necessity for, for travel. Um, another thing when uh, we were on the mission, um, just having a crew that's really flexible and um, being able to be diverse and fix things, um, both um, with hardware as well as emotionally, is super important. You don't have your families call up or you know write a Facebook message and have real-time communications or even have mission support telling you um, how to fix something real time. So you have to really rely on yourselves and be an autonomous crew. So I assure you it's so important to just help that emotional stress that might be on your, your crew because it's a survival thing once you're out there. So Rob, speaking of autonomy, so we talked to Jackie about the prospector and having to find the resources. So now we need to talk about, okay, how we're gonna dig it. So can you talk about the challenges of digging um, in zero gravity, the challenges and maybe also the benefits um, and the importance of autonomy. Okay, in, on Earth, gravity is your friend. In space, we don't have that much gravity. On an asteroid, it's one one thousandth of the gravity here. So if you jump, it'll take you a long time to come back down. Dust that is lofted that just hangs, long hang time on an asteroid. So it's a, it's a problem from that aspect. Uh, then on the, on the moon, we have a one six gravity, and on Mars, 3 eight, so it's reduced gravity. Uh, on Earth, when you dig, what do you think of? Think of a large yellow machine on a construction site. Why is it so big? It's big because it can be big. 
but more importantly, it's big because it needs reaction force. And with all that mass, you get a lot of reaction force. And that's in one G. So let's put that in one sixth G, that's be six times bigger. So imagine sending something six times bigger than a front end loader to the moon to dig the regolith. It's not very practical. So we had to reinvent digging. And that's what you see here. You see a robot that's designed to dig in a completely new way. So how do you reinvent digging? Well, I need X amount of soil, regolith, so many kilograms. So I can take one big scoop or lots of small scoops. So that's what you see there, is lots of small scoops. But if I have lots of small scoops, how do I actuate lots of small scoops? Well, our ancestors have figured out that small scoops on a wheel is quite efficient. That's called a bucket wheel. A bucket wheel is nothing new, but what we did is we turned the bucket wheel into a bucket drum. So you stack up a bunch of bucket wheels, you get a bucket drum, that's what you see there, and then you can dig very efficiently with lots of small scoops. And even that's not enough, because every small scoop has a reaction force. So how do you eliminate the reaction force? That was a big challenge here. So the way we eliminated the reaction force is we took the digging implement, which is that bucket drum, and we took a mirror image of it, completely symmetrical. Every time a scoop engages into the soil, the opposite scoop also engages into the soil. The horizontal forces cancel each other out. Remember from your high school physics, draw a free body diagram, and the two forces cancel each other out. Now you have a zero horizontal uh, reaction force digging device. There is some vertical reaction force, but the scoops are curved and they're self-anchoring, and that cancels out the vertical force. So we got a patent for this because it's the first excavation device that has zero horizontal uh, digging, reaction digging forces. So that's the main innovation of this machine. It is a robot. It has little cameras in between those bucket drums, stereo cameras. It can drive, navigate, and uh, the way it works is the first time it goes very slowly and finds the mining zone, and then starts digging a trench, and then brings the regulars back to the processing plant, and after that, it goes faster because it's already learned the path. And then it can go autonomously, and it repeats that operation many times. So we will need autonomous robots because we will not have crew there on the first few missions. Uh, like I mentioned, you can't come home without the propellant. We can't bring the propellant there because we need 30 tons of propellant and with a gear ratio that Phil mentioned, it's about 10 to 1 from Mars surface to low Earth orbit. That's not even coming back to the surface. So just to lower the orbit is 10 to 1. So you need 30 tons of propellant. You need 300 tons of propellant in low Earth orbit. An SLS is approximately 100, maybe bigger. So that's two to three SLS rockets just to bring the propellant to come home. But if you have ISRU, instead of bringing 300 tons of propellant, you can bring one ton of ISRU equipment, 1,000 kilograms, and that ISRU equipment uses the local resources to make the propellant. But you can't do that with humans because the humans aren't there yet. We have to make the propel before the humans ever leave Earth. So that means autonomy. So all these things have to be autonomous. Jim mentioned that the equipment has to be very robust. As imagine your car driving for five years without an oil change, no brake job, nothing. No air in the tires. Five years your car has to work for 24 hours a day without a driver. Think about that. So, uh, Dr. Metzger, this is for you. So, talking about the propellant um, and the implications. So, when the let's say the NAV has to has to be in Mars before humans get there, and what did you, we learn from the Apollo era as far as blast areas and things like that that we need to like, mitigate? Okay. Yeah. So, if you're going to send a robotic spacecraft to land on Mars and make the propellant so that you can come back, then the next spacecraft that goes to use the propellant is going to have to land near the first one, right? To get the propellant that was just made. And the last thing you want to do is land next to it and fling a whole bunch of rocks at very high velocity and poke holes in your gas station and let all the gas escape. Because then you have no way to get home. So we need to control the rocket blast effects. Um, now during the Apollo program, we got some experience with rockets landing on a regolith, but it was a lot different than what we expect from Mars. 
on the moon, there's no atmosphere, and so the rocket exhaust was spread out and it scoured a broad area. Um, you couldn't see a crater under the lander, and that's why there are conspiracy theorists say that we didn't land on the moon. But in reality, there's no atmosphere, and the gas spread out over a wide area, and it actually blew about one or two tons of soil on every landing. Um, but on Mars, there is an atmosphere. It's going to focus the rocket exhaust into a narrow jet, and it's going to be like a postal digger. And so if you land on thick, deep regolith, it's going to dig a deep hole. I brought a little show and tell, and you're welcome to come play with it afterwards. Um, this was a retirement gift that, that the guys in the swamp works gave me when I retired. But um, gas is very efficient at digging holes in soil. And, and by the way, there's tiny Osiris Rex. This is how Osiris Rex is going to get at regolith off the asteroid. They're going to put a cup down, and inside the cup it's going to do a puff of gas. You see how it throws the, the soil up vertically if it's going to land in the perimeter of the cup. Um, but so when you land on Mars, it's going to poke holes in the regolith. And so we've been trying to figure out how do we control that? How do we stop the ejector? One way you can do it is maybe build a landing pad. And so I think Jim's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, he's got some coupons. Um, another possibility is redesign your vehicle to minimize the blowing dirt. Uh, an example of that is this, the Curiosity with Sky Crane. They, they lowered the, the rover down on cables while the rockets stayed higher in the air. Um, but even so, that was just uh, like a one-ton payload. And even with a one-ton payload, those rockets that high in the air blew holes in the regolith and it blew gravel back and got gravel all over the top of Curiosity and even damaged one of the sensors on Curiosity. So now imagine a 40-ton lander. Um, so, so we're still working on this. Uh, we think that you can judiciously choose your landing sites where there's bedrock, there's shallow, redesign the vehicle, and we still haven't ruled out the possibility that we might need to 3D print landing pads on Mars. And so we're working on all these things in, in parallel until we can get to the right solution. So that's a perfect segue to Jim. So yes, you heard him right. So using that regolith to 3D print landing pads and possibly uh, radiation shields. So Jim, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Britt uh, showed you some simulant, asteroid simulant. So imagine if you're going to Osiris Rex, uh, Osiris Rex is going to Bennu and it finds that uh, it take, brings back a sample of, of the regolith on, on the Bennu finds that it contains water, it contains uh, a lot of useful materials that NASA can, can utilize for ISRD applications. Uh, or, or on Mars, uh, also the regolith may be contain clay type minerals. Uh, if you can harden th that soil, you can make landing pads. Uh, so we have some uh, examples of that here. This is. Uh, uh, a lunar simulant, lunar regular simulant called JSC-1A. And it's a lunar simulant that's been baked at a high enough temperature so that the, the loose granular particles actually uh, harden and form this, this, uh, this uh, solid structure. And if you could make uh, uh, the surface harden that way, a landing craft um, descending on the surface on this landing pad won't create as much dust as it would otherwise. You know, the landing crafts are going to create craters and uh, if there's loose regular uh, exposed uh, on the surface. And if you can harden the surface, you can make it a safe uh, site for landing. Uh, the other application, um, in the swamp works have been working with uh, Dr. Bread and Dr. Metzger with the asteroid simulants. And so we also made some coupons um, based on the asteroid simulant that they're making. And we made this at, at KSC as well. And so this is a, a, a hardened uh, piece of uh, asteroid simulant. Now what's unique about this is that it contains water, it contains carbon, and those materials could be used not just for landing pads, but for radiation shielding. So imagine that you, uh, Osiris Rex finds that um, the asteroid Bennu is suitable for producing uh, radiation shields in space. So astronauts 
uh, that are going to go on deep space missions are going to be exposed to space radiation. They need a way to protect them. Uh, the spacecraft, if it doesn't have radiation shielding, it, it's going to need it. And uh, if you could make the radiation shield shielding from asteroid materials, that's another way to save money. You don't have to launch the heavy mass of these shields from Earth, uh, from the surface of the Earth. So you can manufacture these uh, radiation shields in space uh, for use uh, for space, um, uh, to block space radiation. So it would enable um, you know, uh, deep space missions for NASA. So Dr. Britt, we're gonna end with you since we're here for our Cyrus we're gonna end on asteroids. So can you speak a little bit about how the asteroid regolith differs from the Martian regolith? Like what those differences are if that their mining opportunities are different or anything like that? Night and day. What you're looking at on Mars, of course, is a planet that's been heated, differentiated, has a geologic history and has evolved over time. What you're looking at in Bennu is a survivor from the earliest days of the solar system that essentially is sampling um, Fairly the fairly pristine material that we made the solar system out of. So it's been much less processed. It contains uh, uh, much more um, low temperature, water rich, organic rich material. So if you're looking for a prop for, if you're prospecting for a rich orbit, and from a geological point of view, I'm a geologist. What you want to do is you want to concentrate the in interesting stuff in one place. That's the definition of an ore. What then it does is it concentrates things that you can use for consumables, um, fuel, <coughs> in one place. And actually, in many ways, it's far richer than, the, than the, uh, the, a lot of places on the surface of Mars. Because what Mars has done is it's differentiated. It's essentially produced a surface of high temperature material. And then it was a, is, is entirely composed of low temperature materials that are a much better source of raw material. So I fit, I now have a follow up to Joya. So he said the asteroid soil is much more uh, enriched. So speaking of the Martian soil, so what is the challenge that you have to uh, solve, and, you know, to maybe speak to your Martian garden project you're working on now? Well, you know, we're, we're still not entirely sure if plants could be grown in Martian regolith. We have some studies going on both at Kennedy Space Center and at FIT with the Buzz Aldrin Institute located there, looking at um, could could plants be grown in the Mars simulants? We've actually grown, you know, these potatoes were grown in one of the Mars simulants. The simulants may have um, some properties that are very similar to what's been done on Mars, but they may also have some, some big differences. And, you know, one of the things that we would need to test would be, could, could they be grown in other types of simulants? And do they need to be? Is it more efficient to grow plants in, in regolith, or would, would hydroponics be better? These are all trade studies that would need to be worked out. Um, there are a lot of nutrients that could be available from, from the different simulants, or from the, the different regolith sources, um, that would ben benefit plants. There are also nutrients from the waste that could benefit plants. You know, recycling those nutrients is gonna be very critical, as, as Annie said, and it, it would be very critical from a plant growth perspective as well. Because plants need a lot of the same minerals that we do. And so um, where where can we get those minerals so we don't have to launch everything from Earth? It's gonna be really critical. So I know I ring my mouth the whole time. Does anyone have questions? If you shot up your hand, I'm sorry, I missed it. All right. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes, I think, before we need to get you guys on the bus. Is that correct, Brittany, or? Four. What time do y'all have to get out of here? Because you're just wondering. So, okay, so, we'll start here. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Mantovani. Uh, you mentioned how that material from asteroid uh, regolith could be compressed and turned into shielding. Um, does it retain the same amount of shielding proper properties when it's compressed? Does it get better if it's compressed, or do you, do you need more material? Yeah, so what, what provides the shielding is, is the, basically the hydrogen that's in the water. So if you have hydrated minerals, it could be OH or H2O, 
as long as you have that hydrogen present, uh, that's going to help to, because the, the uh, galactic cosmic rays are of similar mass. And so you want to be able to transfer the energy from these cosmic ray particles to similar sized particles. If they were heavy atoms, they would just bounce off and they wouldn't lose energy or momentum. And so you want to dissipate that momentum. And uh, the presence of water in the asteroid um, regolith is going to help. Hi there. So a lot of the uh, activities you're talking about, mining, refining, um, baking together regolith, are going to be very high energy. How are we going to power these processes on the vehicles that are actually going to be doing it? Nobody else wants to touch that one. <laughs> it's very simple, new to. Uh, the baseline mission for the Evolved Mars campaign right now assumes a, a 50 kilowatt nuclear power plant that comes in these 10 kilowatt uh, kilopower units, is what we call them. And so the, the easy answer is nuclear. RTGs or no, actual reactors? fission. fission. So so, we there's no treaties that I know of. Uh, so the, the, uh, there's no, nothing illegal about taking nuclear into space. Remember, the, the sun is a nuclear reactor. And there's space is full of radiation. Uh, so really, nuclear is the answer for space. The, the trouble is not nuclear in space. The trouble is getting it to space. When you see people protesting outside our gates about nuclear launches, they're not worried about the nuclear in space. They're worried about the segment from the Earth's surface to low Earth orbit. They're worried about something going wrong there. And that's understandable. However, we have other ways of producing energy in space. Uh, space is full of energy, much, much more energy than, than we have here. Uh, you can produce it through direct